About 140 years ago, Dostoevsky published his book, The Brothers Karamazov. And in it, he has an uncanny accuracy, which was true of all of his novels, as he looked ahead. And he posed the challenges of modernity in a literary form. Uh, and I would say in a manner that has never been matched, so that it's still quoted to this day as among uh, the most insightful uh, ways of treating these things. Uh, in, in that book, in two particular chapters that are side by side, um, seem to me to kind of interlink uh, the present great challenge of our time. The first is a chapter named Rebellion. And this chapter is a conversation between the youngest Karamazov brother, Alyosha, and the hardened, rather atheistic brother, Ivan. It's Ivan's presentation of the problem of evil. Uh, and he goes straight to the juggler. In fact, Dostoevsky later said he thought he perhaps had written too good a job with a problem of evil uh, on in the character Ivan's, I mean, it's a favorite chapter of atheists. I mean, and it's a Christian novel. But he goes straight to the juggler. There's no questions uh, in this about natural evil, like, uh, you know, why does God allow some people to be struck by lightning or whole villages to be destroyed by a tsunami? Uh, I don't know. The natural evil just doesn't get quite as poignant. He goes instead to the problem of evil as manifested in the torture and suffering of innocent children. Ouch. I'll share only a paragraph from that, and I apologize for its graphic depiction, though that's the point. Uh, and I'll add that this kind of story, which actually Dostoevsky based on a newspaper account in his own time, um, but th this kind of thing can be found in our newspapers every other day. So, Ivan says, but about little children I can do even better. I've collected, he said, a great, great deal about Russian children, Alyosha. A little girl, five years old, is hated by her father and mother, a most honorable and official people educated and well-bred. So these educated parents subjected the poor five-year-old girl to every possible torture. They beat her, flogged her, kicked her, not knowing why themselves, until her whole body was nothing but bruises. Finally, they attained the height of finesse in the freezing cold. They locked her all night in the outhouse because she wouldn't ask to get up and go in the middle of the night as if a five-year-old child sleeping its sound angelic sleep could have learned to ask by that age. And for that, they smeared her face with her excrement and made her eat the excrement, and it was her mother, her mother who made her, and this mother could sleep while her poor little child was moaning all night in that vile place. Can you understand that a small creature who cannot even comprehend what is being done to her in a vile place in the dark and the cold, beats herself on her strained little chest with her tiny fist and weeps with her anguish, gentle, meek tears for dear God to protect her. Can you understand such nonsense, my friend and my brother, my godly and humble monastic novice? Can you understand why this nonsense is needed and created? Without it, they say, Man could not even have lived on earth, for he would not have known good and evil. Who wants to know this damned good and evil at such a price? The whole world of knowledge is not worth the tears of that little child to dear God. I'm not talking about the suffering of grown-ups. They ate the apple and to hell with them all. Let the devil take them. But these little ones. Yes. Dostoevsky. Uh, whew. <laughs> I've had that conversation um, with other graphic versions of it, including a conversation with someone who could have been the little girl. Yeah, that's a tough one. To this suffering, Ivan concludes that if it is somehow necessary to God's plan of salvation, then he says, I refuse the ticket. I refuse the ticket. He says he wants nothing to do with it. 
His is not an argument against the existence of God. It's an argument against the goodness of God. And I will note that much of secular atheism that we see, as I mentioned last night, we see so prominently today, belongs to the type depicted in Yvonne. There's a bitter, angry edge to it. The second challenge, that's the first one, and it's strong enough. The second challenge, though, is fame found in the next chapter. It's called The Grand Inquisitor. Yvonne calls this tale a parable, and in it, Christ returns to earth in Spain during the height of the Inquisition. Oh, he's just going with all the hard stuff. During the height of the Inquisition, Jesus returns, walking the streets of Seville. Uh, people are healed simply by touching him. A blind man receives his sight. He raises a child from the dead on the very steps of the cathedral as the funeral procession stops before him. And so the Grand Inquisitor has him arrested and thrown in jail. Inquisitor comes to see Christ in prison to be sure he's who he thinks he is, and he's not doubting who he thinks he is, but he says to him, you have no right to interfere. That you had your chance and you blew it. And that it's taken us years <laughs> to get over you and get this thing well organized. Um, he said, people want to be happy. Remember what we said last night about happiness. In that measure, he said, people want to be happy. And that, says the Inquisitor, is what the medieval church is providing happiness. And you have no right to interfere. Well, I'll not parse Dostoevsky's analysis of Roman Catholicism. He was a bitter critic, pretty much a Russian of his time. Uh, but I think we could transfer this parable to the religion of modernity. Because um, make no mistake, modernity as a philosophy is a religious philosophy. It has a narrative that tries to tell the story of the meaning of things. I mean, it's a little bit, though, like Jonathan was showing us of what modernity is doing with its art and its technique that is revealing the emptiness of its project. I'll not parse this analysis of Dostoevsky's, but the very core of the modern project is a quasi-religious commitment to the notion of human happiness, that that's our goal. And the clarity with which he posed the questions uh, are the ones that continue to challenge us, and they're still valid. Christ, the crucified, is an interruption and a contradiction to the modern project. We have proclaimed ourselves committed to building a better world and to reinventing what it means to be human. And we do this in the name of freedom, in the name of happiness, in the name of prosperity, in the name of equality. But for many, the image of the crucified is an image of the failure of God to overthrow the political and economic forces of evil. Just this last week, I was being excoriated by someone uh, for basically uh, abandoning uh, the struggle against right-wing evil. Well, no, I'm still clinging to the cross. And I'll say more about that. Christ, for many, is being reinvented and it's kind of interesting that, that sort of things are turning and, and uh, um, a sort of a reinvention of Christ in some Christian uh, places where he's not being discarded, but he's being the champion of a new deal, uh, one which the Grand Inquisitor uh, would have felt was the true answer uh, to human hunger. The Grand Inquisitor is a religious answer of a sort to the problems displayed in the suffering of the innocent in the chapter on rebellion. Don't you care about the suffering children? Well, that's a really hard one.